Thanks for letting me get the interview with you. You're welcome. Um, I was trying to do the interview before you was you let, you put out that she was running for mayor. You were. I was trying to do the I was trying to do the interview before, and honestly, I'm just be real straight up with you. I feel like when I wanted to do the interview before, it was from a personal level as all right, who was Stokey, and I feel like you went through a lot, and then you was you are very successful. Granted your history of where you came from, right? Right. Honestly, I feel like you putting it out there that you want to run for mayor made the interview so much more complicated and it kind of scared me away from doing the interview. And I'm going to say that because it was a lot of questions that I wanted to ask that as you being a candidate running for mayor, that might be, I don't want to say hard to answer, but might not come from a, a stance that I really wanted to know, but more as though the people and I didn't want it to like make it seem like I was being somebody that I wasn't, if that makes sense. I mean, as long as you're genuine, to me, regardless of the question, I'm gonna give you an authentic answer. So I would never shy away from what you think the people wanna hear. Right. You know, if I was an athlete, you would probably still ask the same question. So me running for mayor, to me, shouldn't you know, stop you from asking the question, you know, especially if it's something you think that's pertinent to my success or my failures, so I, I would ask and then, I mean, it's up to me to be honest and transparent, and that's all I know how to be, so if I were you, I would ask. Right. Nah, I just, I was thinking like, man, because Stokey's my dog, and it's like, I don't want to, you know, some interviewers, they come in, they, they got uh, a particular plan, they, and they got an underlying tr plan that they're trying to get, right. and I'm not that person, 100%. No, I mean, for me, I'm open book. I, I don't really think there's nothing that you can ask me that I'm not willing to answer, you know, right. um, and then when you do decide or whoever decided to run for public office, you open for attack or scrutiny, or whatever it may be. And based on what you just said, most of what you wanted to ask me or anything you want to ask me was prior to me even announcing my candidacy is still irrelevant. Right. It's still individual. I definitely want to tap into that. Right. So you 100%. Feel, We're going to tap into that first. So like, I guess cool. we can even start at just for the people that don't know, because I feel like Stokely, you can Google it and find out everything that happened, but I don't think they understand the process of becoming Stokey of who, who you are now, you in the community, um, just doing everything you're doing for Shoe City and doing everything you're doing for yourself, honestly. Right. Your, your relationships with Rock Nation, your relationships with Emory. I feel like we see that and as younger guys that, that want to do work for the community, like I say, like me, my guy, Aunt, uh, Raven, so many of us, right? We look at you as like, damn, Stokey is doing what I want to do. And I think you running from there is so dope in that sense because it's like, that gives us hope. Like, oh, one day I'm gonna be. I mean, <laughs> I mean that honestly, that that's the reason why. Like, you know, I never wanted to be a politician, you know, or even someone traditionally that's guided by rules and regulations. You know, I've been working for myself for the last ten years, so now to apply for a job to work for six hundred seven thousand people is going to be different. But I think, you know, I, I can do it, you know, without any problems. But for you to say that, you know, I'm someone that influenced you guys to do. What I'm doing in the community or abroad, I think is, I mean, is humbling because I don't really have any body. I think that as of today in Baltimore, I can say, you know what, they doing what I want to do. Mm. And I mean, and sometimes leading by example is hard because the yardstick, you know, that you measure yourself by can be critiqued by people who never really walked in your footsteps. So, but, you know what I'm saying? It's like, wow, they saying this and that, but they don't know how hard it is to do these mm. things. So, I definitely So, let's jump into it, man. Let's, let's jump in into who, who is Stokey? Who, who do you think? I don't know, I mean, it depends on where you want to start. I mean, born and raised in White Lock, better known as Reservoir Hill. Um, grew up in a single family household, you know. My mom was addicted to narcotics and with different type of drugs and to her demise, you know. My father never was in my life. Um, me and my sister, we early on as, as kids got very curious about street life. So I ventured off and started doing things at the age of 10 by way of my biological father. Um, always loved education, you know, went to school. Um, end up one of those kids that wasn't necessarily obedient to all the rules and regulations so I always found myself in trouble mm -hmm. but um I was the kid that everybody liked so I was able to hang out with older guys in the community and do things that I wasn't supposed to be doing at 10 years old I mean so now I'm a father you know I'm a friend um I got my own company I do contracts with companies like you know Shoe City you know partnership with Rock Nation they're like it, it's broad because I can go from you know, my demise when I went to prison and came home and, and went through a lengthy transition or before I went to prison. When I was always giving back to my community, I just was a person who felt the need to do so because my community always supported me. 
So today I sit here, you know, um, hopeful that I can, you know, reciprocate what was given to me to people like yourself or even members of the community. So hopefully we can continue going forward in the positive direction. Right. So when you say you're starting to get into to trouble or things that you want to shut me in at 10, 10 years old, can we get into that? Can we oh, no. I mean, I did what I saw like back in the day when, you know, money was kind of scarce and hard to come by, you know, guys did what they saw other guys doing. And at that time, it was selling marijuana or other drugs. And it was easy accessible in the community where I came from. So they would use younger guys, or they called them protégés, who pretty much was, I guess, strong enough to deal with what came with that lifestyle. And I just became good at it. And I was telling somebody today, sometimes that could be a major default. Because you know, had I not became successful at it, then I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. If I'd have used drugs instead of selling drugs, then maybe I would have been a failure. But I didn't. And I saw what happened to my mom and my uncles and other friends who used drugs and alcohol. So I just tried to do my best to perfect hustling to a point where it all became so successful that they wanted me off the street, you know. And so I ended up selling drugs for like 10, 15 years. And in 1997, 1998, the um, federal government put um, conspiracy charge against me and my co defendants and I went away for 12 years. Jeez. And I came back home, um, resilient, determined, you know, be right by my family. Like, you know, I, I tell people all the time, prison did nothing to me or for me. Um, being away from my kids did everything. Like, so when I realized that I was punishing them based on my selfishness, I wanted to change my thinking, which I knew was going to alter my behavior. And I was going to come home a better man. Because the things I'm doing now was always in me. It just took certain situations to bring it out. So I went through that situation like a man, came home like a man, um, and right can try, you know, about everything that occurred, but now I want to prevent other kids or young men from doing what I did, because sometimes your conditions can cause you to make decisions that could cost you your life, your freedom, or your health. And it's so prevalent now, and that's what I see, you know, especially the crisis we involved in now. Like, kids are doing things because they see it and is available. So hopefully we can try to change that narrative or that paradigm and give kids hope, you know, that's hopeless and find ways to engage them to positive activities so they can be successful. So I definitely just want to say excuse the selfishness as an interviewer because I, I, a lot of my questions are actually personally for me, right. aside from the whole marriage situation we'll get into, but like a lot of the things, because I look at you as a mentor figure and you don't get to sit down with somebody that went to jail for 12 years Every day. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, There's a lot of guys that I, you can talk to. But I mean, but that's doing the things that you're doing. Honestly, right. I feel like it's, it's guys out there, don't get me wrong. Right. But honestly, where I be from, uh, a lot of people talk that talk, but when they get when it's time to go to jail, they ain't really walking. Like they really they, they snitching. And yeah. I'm I'm just I can say that. Are you being honest? I'm just being real. We 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 have as a culture found ways to really eliminate the trust factor. And men to me, is a different from a male. God make you a male, you make yourself a man. Um, when I knew that I was facing a life sentence and they was offering me 14 or 15 years as a consolation to take their life sentence, I thought about my sons. Like, I can't teach my sons how to be men if I don't know how to be one. So it wouldn't doubt my mind that I was going to go to jail. I just didn't want to go to jail for life. So I pled guilty to 15 years and did 12 years. But when I look back on it, I didn't know how I was going to start it. Like, and, and when you go to prison, I tell people all the time, as, as a man, you can't cry. You can't be in the cell with another man and you crying about the things that's going, home, going on at home or some dysfunctions in your life. You got to deal with it and you got to suck it up. And that's where I think a lot of hurt people are hurting people because we never had an opportunity. Well, some people have an opportunity to grieve even in prison. If you get a phone call that someone passed away or got killed, you can't go in the TV room and start crying because everybody got problems, you know. And the camaraderie in prison is so difficult because you can be from the same part of town, you know, and you'll hang with somebody from another part of town, but when the tragedy hit home, everybody stick together, you know. It's kind of weird, but and that's what I understand about Baltimore today. You can be from East Baltimore, South Baltimore, Park Heights, but if you're in jail, y'all stick together. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you come home, it's like a big division, you know, and no one wants to really claim what they so territorial, you know. So it, it was kind of strange for me because I went in that in my 20s and I came home when I was 40. But um, I, I think at some point I've give me going away credit for saving my life because the only thing is I was doing at that pace, the only people try to rob you or kill you because of your success. So I believe everything happened for a reason. But 
I mean, I, I'm here in the flesh. I'm blessed. I don't have any complaints. Everything happened for a reason. I was able to come home and build a better, poor relationship with my children. And that's all that mattered to me. It wasn't about coming home, trying to chase time or be vindictive and angry and upset and bitter. I ain't had time for that. I feel like the hardest thing to, to be, um, one of the hardest things of being a mentor is trying to get people to listen. And I right. feel like sometimes <clears throat> it looks like a contradiction because when you're telling somebody the route that they shouldn't go because it's not the right way, they look at you like, well, you did it. And that right there is, that's like a, uh, looking yourself in the mirror because it's like if you did it and you're saying that this came, positive came from it, why shouldn't they do it? Well, again, you know, you, you got to look at the, 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 the whole entire scope. First of all, it was, it was wrong what I did. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't legal. It was something I did that was illegal. And I made it look good. And all those success, successful people who, or quote unquote, think they're successful because they obtained wealth through it, I mean, you still are demonizing other individuals. You know, you're still affecting your community whereas though you're placing hardship on other people's families. You know, like somebody always say, yo, Stoke, you can't carry that, that grudge on yourself. Somebody else would have did it to him. Yeah, but I don't want to do it. So now there's kids out here, like you said, who wanted to sell drugs because they seen me sell drugs. And some of them lost their life, their freedom and their health. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I can seek atonement and, and pray about forgiveness and things of that nature, but I still got to be at peace with myself. Right. So not to contradict what you're saying, to me, that's the sign of a hypocrite. Just because you do it, they don't make it right. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying as a father, you tell your son, okay, yeah, I hit this woman, that don't mean you, your son okay for your son to do it. Right. Because you got to learn from your mistakes. And my mistakes to you are free. Yours going to cost you. So... I just I disagree with that premise in terms of No, I'm saying so what I'm saying is some people that that's doing it, of course you're trying to teach them not to do it, but a lot of people don't listen. So if they they, they turn around and say, Well, you did it. And I didn't listen. I mean, I didn't listen to a lot of guys that were telling me not to do it. I mean, again, you know So how do we change that though? Well, because, because they it's about relationships, trust and respect. At the end of the day, you know, um most young men know right from wrong, you know, and it's just a matter of, of time. And again, when you speak about giving them information and they're not listening then sometimes you gotta knock a little harder because i think what, what most kids want to know that somebody care about them you know if they know you care about them and you sincere they'll listen it happened time and time again or sometimes they might have to go through it you know my own biological son you know he's going through what i went through and i, I did everything in my power financially inspirationally motivationally to cure or kill the generational curse but living in baltimore he made a poor decision same decision that uh, another athlete might make, protect himself. But in Baltimore, it's a different set of circumstances. So, um, and it, that still bothers me to this day that, you know, I couldn't give him enough information to make better decisions at that time, not in his life. Because sometimes you got 10 seconds to make a decision. And sometimes with me, I always say, well, what would this person do? What would that person do? Sometimes it's, it's not the best of situation. I mean, you know, I always say the difference between me, Oprah, you know, Jay-Z or Byron Scott was a different 10-second decision. They did something different. I went left, they went right, and they kept on going left. I went right, right, left, and ended up getting lost. So it depends on where you are in your life and the information that someone gives you. If you trust that information and you apply it to your life, there's a good chance you're going to get what they got. Right, because it's just, to me, it's, it's irritating because, like, like you said, if, if you can help somebody not have to go through what you have to go through, like, that's one of the greatest feelings in the world, but it seems like that's one of the hardest things because people just don't listen. What you want to tell somebody that, that's trying to feed their family? You can't tell somebody that's harmed, you can't tell them nothing. See, you know what I'm saying? I think listening and applying information is different. Okay. So what you're saying is that there's no doubt in my mind they listen. But you made have a good point. Sometimes people are not in a situation to stop and immediately what they're doing to follow your lead. Mm -hmm. And I respect that as well. There's a lot of friends I got that still stuck. And they were like, more than anything, to just stop what they're doing to get you know, in the car with me and ride around and have fun. But they got a lot of respect for me, you know, that I'm not going to condemn them because of what they're doing, but I can't condone what they're doing either. You know what I'm saying? So they respect me enough to stay away. But I think most people who are hopeless don't really see a reason to stop. You know, they don't see, okay, well, what's going to happen if I stop? Am I going to get a job? You know, no one's going to give me any money. No one's going to take care of my family. That's what I was trying to get to. How do we get yeah. Because you got you to create situations, opportunity, and get these people real resources. And once you evaluate the individual, because everybody can't be a Fort Lick driver, right? Everybody can't be an NFL player. So you got to help them where they are. You know, I mean, you talk about kids from 18 to 25. They are at risk right now in Baltimore based on this crisis. So my thing is you find out what they're good at. 
and then you plow all the resources you can and you invite those guys to come out to whether it be seminars or it could be a training exercises that's going on in the community and give them some type of opportunity to be a part of it. And hopefully that will be enough to get them started. And then you bring in more resources on top of resources, you know, and they get employment or someone might have a mental illness or they might have some other defect, but you help them where they are. And once they believe in you and trust you, they're going to follow you into the end, wherever that may be. I mean, it's guys who I have got employment who never thought they would work in their life. And they realize, yo, I didn't have to go to jail to get a job. Something scared me. Or the big homie said this and said that, you know. And it depends on the leader, right? You know, everybody can't be a leader. You see, it's guys I see now who want to be a leader, but, you know, leaders are born. You can't make a person be a leader. You can put him in a leadership position, but that don't mean he's going to lead effectively. And you can tell by the people that follow him, you know. You know, you look at football as an example. You can have a good quarterback and you have a great quarterback, right? But that don't mean they're going to be leaders. You got somebody that can lead the team to victory even when things don't look like it's going their way because the team will follow him, you know, even at his on his bad day or worst day, you know. So I think for me it's never been difficult because my experience beats people's opinion. Mm. And, like, they know I went through it. Sometimes people just talk about what they're going to do and they don't have the experience to match it. And I think you see that every day. That's real prevalent with a lot of guys who's giving people advice. Some of them haven't really had the experience to tell somebody what not to do. Like, I, people don't understand this about me. I don't drink, never drink, never use drugs. So I can't tell somebody how it feels to be high. But I can tell you what it did to my mother, my uncle, my cousin, and my sister. And that's first-hand, it's not first-hand experience from a personal perspective, but I witnessed it so long, you I think it. I can give you advice. Yeah. Exactly. No, I understand exactly. My um, mom did the same thing. I, um, Speaking of leader, I feel like that's a perfect segue into when I first noticed who Stokey was. It was during the um, whole Freddie Gray situation right. and the rise, and uh, you were actually being stepping into that leadership position. When um, I think the first time I ever saw you was on Cloverdale, the right. basketball right. court, right. and um, you like I don't know how you did it, but you somehow you got everybody to come to Cloverdale to meet up. Right. No, it was kind of crazy because um, <clears throat> that that day in particular, everybody was told that. It was going to be some type of demonstration at the Freddie Gray's funeral, but for everybody to stand down with protesting and being um, confrontational with the police until after the funeral, respect the family. So um, I was at the funeral outside and go in, um, but I remember leaving the funeral and going down to the Horseshoe Casino. And if you've ever been there before, they got TVs, you know, in the center of the casino where you can watch, but you just can't hear. And I was down there, I think I was playing blackjack or something, and my, and my friend Embry, he called me, like, yo, what's going on in Baltimore? I'm like, nothing, everything cool. He's like, no, nah, where you at? I'm like, I'm in Baltimore. <laughs> but I ain't one time I was at the horseshoe. Everything cool. <laughs> yeah, but I'm inside. I ain't one time I was at the horseshoe. He's like, nah, man, they, they going crazy. I said, nah, everything good. But I remember hearing police going up Russell Street, like the whole train of police. Like, I mean, I look outside, I can see Under Ronald County police. Boy, I'm like, where are these police going at? And then I look at the screen, I just split screen on scene, and I got Mon Darman on the left, and they got Pennsylvania Avenue, um, CVS on the right. And I see CVS on fire, and I see uh, people running out of Mon Darman. I'm like, what the hell? And so I got on the phone, I'm like, yo, I see what's going on. So I had got dropped off, I wasn't driving. At that time, I was living downtown. When I got to my house, I seen kids with book bags and rocks along with the police with shields. So I'm like, man, and like, we gotta do something. We gotta do something. I said, dude, what? I'm not jumping in front of no kid with no, no damn rock, man. You doing that? <laughs> so now he said, no, That's I a did. different type of protein. Like, you got to do something, man. I, like, no, I said, so I called Meek Mills, and I said, man, I need you to post this flyer. You know, because at that time, Meek had, I think, four million followers at the time. And I said, Amy, we're going to um, tell people to come out, and we're going to use Facebook and social, I mean, Instagram, you know, our social network platforms to get people to come out. We're going to have a conversation about what we need to do to stop this or get everybody engaged so we can have... Um, a reason to, you know, or we know we know what the reason is, but do it in the right respectful way, demonstrate in a way where though we don't have to feel like, you know, we we causing more problems, you know. Mm. And we got together and we met and we talked about it and we would let the kids speak about how frustrated they was about what was going on. Cause I never felt like those kids should have been the ones who represented us in a way where though it was a, a very grave injustice or social injustice. I thought growing up should have had that conversation a long time ago. But it didn't, so I'm glad it did happen the way it did. And then with a few other people, the Iron Maidens of the world, um, I mean, Erica, you know, it's a few other people I knew who was on the ground mm -hmm. who was about action, wasn't talking, wasn't afraid about losing a job or 
any type of resources or grant that may have come way by the city or any type of government officials. And we decided to organize a march East Baltimore and West Baltimore and go down to City Hall and use that platform to address our concerns, you know. And um, to this day, I feel like that that's probably something I'll never forget. But I, I don't think it went as far as it should have went. I think that was a moment in time that should have been a movement, you know, but I think it became a moment that turned to silence, you know. And that's why I still, to this day, I do my best in my individual and my official capacity to try to protect and serve those who, are, who don't have a voice or a platform and make sure they get what they got coming. So I ain't even gonna lie, like just being honest and we man, we can be right. honest with each other. Like before I actually met you, you know what I'm saying? Like when I seen it, I thought it was just being honest. I'm like, I thought it was like a popularity stunt. I'm like, man, he got he got all this this clout. So it's just like because it's the right thing to do. Because it was other people that was on the ground as well and that's been on the ground and I ain't see like nobody was praising it. I'm like, that that's not fair, because I've been seeing these people right. put in work, but nobody's praising these people. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like at first, but then when I met you, I think I met you like a couple of years after, maybe a year after. Right. And I saw you was actually, I remember telling somebody like, that this thing, the thing about Stokey is, all he do is just put work into the community. All he do is, I want this community want to give homeless people right. shoes, want to, want to do things with kids. It's like, it's like, she's like, what else do we do? So, but I definitely, I just definitely want to say that because I'm a man. No, I can I can no, say it's not, man, you know what, my no, fault or whatever. No, it's, it's not even, you don't got to apologize for that. It's, it's a lot of people in Baltimore who don't have premium or platinum platforms that give their heart and soul to the city that don't get recognized. And, man, I can honestly tell you the city has never gave me a trash bag, a citation or anything otherwise for what I do. And I don't do it for that, you know. Um, a lady sent me a post today that she said, you should never do nothing for recognition. You should always do it for your for the intentions, mm -hmm. right? And I was my rebuttal to her was well sometimes you gotta do it so other people can do it too. Because if you say, Well, why are they posting and giving stuff away? Yeah, because you want everybody to know it's a problem. Facts. Because they, you don't show them, they will never know. Then they go, so oh, I ain't know. Well now you do know. Right. And now they do it to be braggadocious, you know, and things like that. Because like if if you know, you do research, you know, Baltimore is small. You don't have to look far or, or long to find out where a person come from and what their morals and principles are because the per person is going to tell you whether they was a chump in high school or they snatched pocketbooks or they did anything like that. They go, the past is going to tell the future or the present what that person is about. And I never ran from anything that I thought I loved or wanted to do. And give back was always something I was passionate about. I tell people all the time, and you ho hopefully you realize this one day in your life. You know what? You have to know the difference between your passion and your purpose. Mm. You know, my passion can be playing basketball, helping music uh, musicians out, but my purpose has always been give back and, and serving because that makes me feel good inside. I can't explain that feeling. Like no matter where I go in the world, I always find a way to, to think about coming back home and do bigger and better things. You know. So, and so real quick, but these it's a lot of other guys I want to praise that don't give a platform. That's why I said. We had to find a, um, a common ground for all those stakeholders that's doing the same things in these communities to find a way to get together so it can be a team effort and not mm -hmm. just so they can get recognized so we can accomplish the same goals. So why don't you, so when did you, my question is, when do you think you, um, since we, we got past the, the who is Stokey and just how, like I saw you right. and I guess how you got popular, I guess we can say that. Because yeah. I feel like you, at that, you, <laughs> Honestly, I feel like that was really a time where Stoke D. I'm gonna ask you, do you think that was a time where it, you went from, all right, I'm Stokey, just got out of prison, to Stokey, this public figure? No, because see, you you young. You don't you you probably don't know about when they had me on America's Most Wanted for doing certain things. I heard about that. I heard you, about you probably that. don't yeah. know when we were riding the first guys in West Baltimore to ride dirt bikes and things like that. So. I mean, not necessarily a popularity contest, but I always had a reputation for beating the odds, so to speak, you know, or the first person to do this or right. second person to do that. And whether it was good, bad, or indifference, we always, in my neighborhood, try to stay relevant by, by force, you know, and not necessarily choosing to, to find a camp. It just happened organically, you know, whether it be a, a, a girlfriend that was famous or hang with the big homie that was famous and, you know, things like that. So i always been blessed with healthy relationships. So. I don't think the riot, the riot may have awakened younger generation to, you know, who I was, but you got people like Erica who been on me pretty much my whole life. Right. And it may be because we were at the same age. So I think to your point about um, changing my status quo, I think that's an understatement because I've been, 
If, honestly, if it's not for who I was, I couldn't have galvanized those people. Mm. So some you have to have some type of credibility. Right. So you come out and they're going to listen. You know? So this before the ride, you know, or after the ride happened, but still have to get in a position to, for somebody to trust you, you want to follow you. I mean, you know, in, in a, a form of Martin Luther King type <laughs> march, you know what I'm saying? Like, that ain't nothing right, anybody yeah. can do. So, I mean, I'm blessed with my relationships. But, no, I think for the younger generation, like, it's guys who didn't know me before because they met my son. Like, no, I'm his father. He's my son. I came first. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, a lot of people don't understand, you know, like, I've been doing things like this for a long, long time. It just so happened now, social network is able to record, okay, you know, and put these things in a different light. That makes sense. So now we here. When, when did you choose, or when did you decide you wanted to run for mayor? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I, I still haven't chose to run. I just filed, and the reason why I say run because, you know, I had a conversation with my son, and I was telling everybody not probably gonna be redundant at, the, at that few interviews, but I was in court with a friend, and I went to go visit my son, who's six years old at school, and he was in time out. It was dark outside. I mean, it was dark inside in his classroom, and he looked up like, you know, kind of afraid because he wasn't expecting me to come check, check, check him out in school. And I asked him what he did to be in time out, and he told me he did something you know, he wasn't supposed to be doing. I'm like, well, if you continue to do that, you can't go to L.A. with me, because at that time I was one foot in the door to move to L.A. He's like, well, I can't go anywhere. My mom said I can't go. He said, but, Dad, why do you want to go to L.A.? Why you don't like Baltimore? I like, I said, Baltimore, I just some things change. You know, I think it's probably best for me and, to go, you know, do something different. He's like, no, nah, you can tell me the truth. You don't like Baltimore, right? I said, what you mean, right? He said, you don't like Baltimore because they got a lot of murders. And he's six years old. And like, I'm like, no, what are you talking about? Because I tell people all the time, I protect my son. Like, he, you know, he, we talk about Tom Brady, you know, Stephen Curry, I mean, Kevin Durant. You know, we, we into things of that nature, musicians, you know, stuff like that. And with technology, he's able to surf the web to find out certain things about people that he know we speak about, but not about violence, you know. So, I mean, I felt like I failed him. So I got in the car and started crying, like, yo, we got to get out of here. So I called my sister and told her to pack her stuff up. We moving. Like, yo, y'all want to go Atlanta, L.A., Charlotte? I got y'all. Let's, let's pack up. We gone. And she thought something happened. Like, she thought maybe something happened to one of my children or me because I was crying. She's like, yo, what's wrong, Black? What's wrong? Like, nothing. Just pack your stuff. We got to get out of here. So once I calmed down and told her what happened, she said, right, I'll start looking. So I went home and laid down just to think about the decision I was about to make and evaluate things, you know, how it would affect me financially, you know, my, my family and job separation and things like that. And I was just sharing with Eric and Tiff, you know, and Ma, a video came on my phone from YouTube, said, you the one. And I normally don't open videos from YouTube because it really be about people or things I don't really follow. But I opened it up and it was, a motivational speech from different people. And it awakened something in me. So once I listened to the speech, I called, you know, I emailed Jay-Z and I emailed another guy by Jay Brown, like, what do y'all think about me leaving Baltimore? No, not coming to LA, standing in Baltimore, trying to be build a city. And, you know, because we had just, they had just told me, come out here, just, you know, we got you, just get out here, you know, everything good. And they thought something happened to me and why I wanted to change my decision. So I talked to Emory about it. And I emailed all three of them the same message. I just changed the name. You know, I had the same speech, just changed the name, you know. And they came back with different reasons. And Emory's rationale was, you know, I want you out of Baltimore because, you know, you got a lot of stuff going on right now and you need to be in L.A. with all this business that happened. But to me, you've always been the mayor of Baltimore. So if I was you, you can always go to L.A. Stay, get it right, and whatever we can do to help you, fine. So at that time, I still didn't think about being the mayor. And then I was talking to Jay Brown. He's like, man, you know, whatever your decisions you make, we behind you, you know, 100%, you know. And then Jay, Jay was like, man, you can either leave Baltimore and have regrets, or you can leave Baltimore and be proud. Mm -hmm. So he said, leave or leave. And I just said, well, you know what? It makes sense to me to leave because my family and my friends here. And I mean, I wasn't worrying about anything negative, I still don't, like, people wonder why I walk around how I feel, guys, me today, do you nervous? I'm nervous about what? Like, honestly, there's nothing that politicians or politicians can say or do to me that my mother or the streets ain't prepared me for. So I was Mr. Coppin or whatever, and it's not the mayor of Baltimore <laughs> by a long shot, but right. when, I, when I was thinking about your situation, I had to put myself in the, in the same shoes because 
I was popular. I was coming from Morgan, which is like a rival school. And a lot of the uh, the scrutiny that I was getting running from Mr. Coppin was because I was popular and they felt like it was going to make me more popular. And I hear people saying that about you in this situation about like, is is just a popularity contest or he's trying to, um, he know he's going to get a lot of uh, publicity from it or even money, even if you don't win. What do you say about that, though? What do you say to that point? Because I feel like I've, like I said, no, no, running for Mr. Coppin is far a stress for mayor, but I've got that. And in your position, I, I think it's similar, and I want to know what do you say to that? Ho hopefully through campaigning, right? And I'm always going to be organic and real as possible because I think, to me, anything less, you know, would be a subtraction from who I am as an individual. Money don't make me happy. And anybody who knows me knows that. But it, I always take in consideration that it's 637,000 people in Baltimore. All of them don't know me. And when you represent people, you know, of that large, you know, magnitude, you, it's your duty to get in front of them as best you can to tell your story. Um, popularity, I wouldn't even put my, my son through this for a job. I don't need the money. I do very well for myself. I know that the sacrifice I'm making is going to cost me millions of dollars. I know that without a shadow of a doubt, if we talk about money. Um, you know some of the artists I manage. You know how well they're doing. And you can't work for those people and be mad at the same time. <laughs> right. So I have talked about this with my family and my friends and my business partners. And they support the decision, even though I know personally you know, it's not going to be the same for me in terms of receiving revenue beyond someone's comprehension. But what I would tell you in defense of me is that whenever someone has something to say, you, you must ask them, do they know me, right? And if they're not, they need to get to know who I am because I think you had the privilege of being in my, in my presence enough to know that, you know, money is probably the least of my worries and the, the least things in life that will motivate me to do anything, you know? And when it comes to publicity, like, you know, I, I do my best to always be authentic and organic. I, I don't know what being a man could do for me in terms of publicity because on the other side of the coin, if I fail, you know, then what? You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm optimistic. I'm, I stay that way. But I, I don't know, you know how to be anybody but myself. Mm -hmm. And it, I hopefully I get the opportunity to prove all those naysayers wrong and be probably the best man that Baltimore ever had because I can relate to the majority of people on both sides of the fence, you know, whether it be in the community or in business, and I think we need to change. And if those individuals are concerned about me and not concerned about what we have, then my question to you would be to them, what do y'all want? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, if we're looking at what we have now, which I think we got 200-something, 20-something homicides, again, we are going in the direction of another 300 homicide a year. Um, and most of those individuals who have lost their life, I'm not saying I'm a demagogue or I could have saved them, but I know for a fact that most of those individuals, if I could have had a conversation with them and understood what they was going through, put them on the right path, maybe not to succeed overnight, but in that right direction, you know, because most of those kids look like my son, you know. And if I can find a way to reach them where they at, because most of, of their experiences, I, I have experienced already. Most of the things they're going through, I already experienced. So, and, and I don't worry about that. So I, I can't, I know I'll give you a long answer, but I don't even no, that's all good. try to address yeah. um, negativity or pessimistic. And one thing you need to know about me is that moving forward, there's no such thing as oppositional research for me to talk bad about another candidate. Like, this is for Baltimore. This is to build Baltimore up, not to tear nobody down. And our people have always found a way to do that to each other. And I mean, I maybe was guilty of that at one point in time or another in my life, but not now. I mean, I'm trying to stay as positive as possible and give everybody hope and inspire people to be the best they can be and believe in the mantra of one Baltimore instead of what we see today. So I'm encouraged to do that by my team, um, people like yourself who I know who deserve a better Baltimore, you know, and hopefully it comes to fruition. Nah, again, man, like I said, I, I definitely think it's dope and I think it's motivation to the people like myself, like the cool ants, like uh, the Kwamis, like the so many of us that's young that's doing it. But um, what about, so like I said, I was comparing it to me being Mr. Kyle, right? And sometimes I honestly felt like I did 
uh, and Justin, because I always like even in high school I was like the the, the uh, SGA president. Right. I was uh, uh, my class president, National Honor Society president. When I got to Coppin, I was I was Mr. Mr. Coppin. But honestly, looking back, sometimes I was like, was I really for this position, or was it something that was selfish? Because like if I was really for this position, it's people, and I want to get into the education piece. It's people that that has been studying to be. A ma- the mayor for the city or just in a um, political position for years. Right. Like, this is what they love to do. This is that passion. Just like your passion is giving back to people. I feel like, or your purpose is giving back to people. And I feel like those people who are passionate about that, they feel like that's their purpose. Do you feel like you're doing them an injustice, though? Because it's, these guys is giving their life to, so, to the system. So are you talking about because of a position or serving the people? Because you don't need to be mad to serve the people. If these individuals you talking about, are you talking about people going to school or college, you know, and their personal endeavors was to learn a uh, certain curriculum to be in a position to get a job, or are you talking about somebody that's been fighting tooth and nail for the city their entire life who wants to, who wants to continue doing that? Mm-hmm. I'm asking you. Uh, so I'm talking about just both. So when I'm saying fighting for the city, because we see you in the streets, right? We see you giving away shoes and clothes and right. things like that, but it's other people that's sitting in these meetings day and out right trying to trying to change um le- le- right. legislations trying to change laws for the city and because you just so let me ask you a question this is almost like a contest right and it's not about what i think it's about at the end of the day what the people think mm-hmm. I, I we joked last night about being a president i think if you're hot in the right place and you qualify and certified to do a job you should do it may the best man win i don't think me running for mayor to show my love and dedication to my city is a bad thing. No, I don't of think it's I don't know, but I mean, you said, what do I think it's, you know, I guess interfering with someone else's career choice. I mean, you have people who have tried to run for mayor who may have been an excellent mayor if given the opportunity, but the city probably didn't think so. I mean, this is not a popularity contest because people still have to vote. So at the end of the day, I, I think that, and I tell everybody all day long, if it was a candidate that I thought was going to love, protect, and respect Baltimore the way I do, I'm going to support him or her wherever they are. See, that's what I was trying to get at. Because that's what I was saying. Like In my situation, I felt like it was times where I was better off helping somebody become in that position that I had. But let me ask you a question, though. Um, It's almost like a substitute teacher, right? Um, You almost have to give the people what they want. The people, if the people choose you to be the class president or Mr. Coppin, why would you do them a disservice by saying, no, you want somebody else to do it? Because they could have chose somebody else. If they chose you, that's what they want. Or is it, I, that's what I was saying, because I was looking at myself, I'm like, oh, did I do a, did, did them a disservice by even running from the person because I knew they was going to choose me. When I could have really just been a liaison for somebody else that knows the work, that knows the back end, that knows. So let me ask you a question. Based on that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, 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 2014, we had 210 homicides, mm-hmm. right? 2015, we had 344. 2016, we had 319. 2017, we had 343. We had 310 last year. We got 220-something now. You tell me who in politics right now who have done a job that you think is superb enough to say, you know what, they changed that narrative and we need to keep going in that, that direction. I have because no what I'm idea. saying is that based on what you're telling me is that there are people that may be more qualified or certified to say they want to be in that position, right? They saying that, but actually do that record reflect that? Because sometimes you might say, and you spoke about the people in the street that know me, and I'm asking you, I mean, because you got to live in this city as well, and you can't worry about what people say, you got to worry about what people have been doing or the capability to do. I'm saying, you know, I'm from a place where, you know, we have been forgotten, you know? So I understand exactly how these people are so desensitized and so hopeless. Everybody don't have that relationship and they don't have that experience to say, you know what, this is what we need to do to fix this. And as I said before, in plenty of meetings, you know, my, my relationship don't go just with the people in the community. Like I have been invited to the congressional inaugurations by congressmen. I have been invited to the state of the city address by mayors. I've been invited to close quarter meetings by major uh, or, or by most of the majors in the police commission in Baltimore City. They asked me to come there for a reason. So with my experience being on the table and my knowledge of the streets, I, I don't think that's something that should be a flaw on me. I don't think I should be able to say, you know what, let me sit back and keep watching this thing fall apart. And that's what I've been doing. So it's not that I don't think this person 
can do a job. I don't think they've done it. And they was going to do it. They'd have done it already. So I don't know how much longer we got to wait until Baltimore completely crumbles for somebody to step up. Right. Because if you tell me right now you took the job because you want to be popular, then your, your intentions were wrong. Right. So I'm not saying I took the job to be popular. What I'm saying is, and if I really serve Yeah, yeah. Like, if I really, I was just, like I said, I was just thinking it was a thought, like, why didn't I help the person that was in the seat right. do a better job instead of me trying to take over and do that job? And you know what I'm saying? Like, so that's. was you already helping that person and it, and it wasn't helping? I wasn't. Okay. So for me, again, I've been on the ground for the last 10 years helping everybody in every administration. I mean, just up until I decided to run, I was helping Dr. Butler go around and try to help guys in every community come to these meetings and uh, get these guys' records clean and all that kind of stuff from a community perspective, you know, and never getting a dime for it. I never, Nobody never paid me to do none of this stuff, right? And I never wanted to get paid, but my, my question is that I've been doing the work. So I can't say, oh, I, I just started, I, I woke up one morning and said, yo, I want to be mad. No, I've been doing the work that led up to this decision. And I'm saying, if you tell me someone who has been on the ground as an effective leader or community liaison to the people that work for the city, I mean, I, I want to meet that person. Because I, I'm still not saying that these, these people, these individuals can't help me or I can't help them do a job because it's for the city of Baltimore. It's not for me. It's not, you know, I'm good. Like, I want to be clear. I'm good. I don't want to sound arrogant or like an elitist, but, you know, I, I'm not doing this for, for myself. If you tell me right now, people that's, in these positions, if they relate more to you and you think that they got, quote unquote, the antidote to move the city forward, then let's talk about that. But I'm only going on stats. I'm only going by what I see happen over the last five years. If you think Baltimore is getting better, I'm, I'm listening. Right. Nah. I'm going to flip the mic over and ask you, you know what I'm saying? Nah. Uh, <laughs> That's what I'm just here to ask. No, no, I don't know. Point. But now to keep it on it, nah, it's, it's sad. And um, I was really saying that it's starting to look like a genocide, honestly. Like, so many people are dying. And it's just sad. That it's like... Part of me just being a young guy, part of me want to move. You see so many people moving, but I think I seen a speech, a high school student said, if everybody move, if all the good people move out of Baltimore, then how, how is Baltimore going to get good? What, what year were you born? 91. Okay, two years, you was two years old. We've been here before. In 1993, we had 355 homicides. Whether they want to blame on the crack epidemic or New York boys in Baton, Baltimore, but we've been here before. And you, you can't arrest your way out of this crisis. Because then you're going to start mass incarceration all over again. I mean, whether people got mental illness, PTSD, whatever's going on, we have to address these problems head on and not run from them. And we also got to support the police. Whether they saying that the dissent decree is, a, is not allowed them to do their job fully and completely, we got to address those concerns, you know, and bring back more police, I mean, more community police and, and bridge that gap. Because there is uh, a division that happened probably post Freddie Gray that never was put back together again. Mm -hmm. So all those things stacked in what you see today. And these kids are getting more courageous and committing crime because they're allowed to do so. And police are afraid to confront them with it that they're going to lose their job or go to jail. So you can't have a disconnect like that and you worry about and say you worry about public safety. Because that, if that's what you worry about, then you address that way. Is that Un Unfortunately, what you're saying about genocide, it is that way. You know, unfortunately, I don't know if people say, well, it would be better off if a red person killed a black person. Because if you go in a white community, whites probably going to kill whites. Indians kill Indians. Cowboys kill cowboys, right? So I'm thinking that we supposed to come together after what we've been through as the people, you know. Unfortunately, we, we haven't got there yet. I think we 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 beyond what someone else done to us and worry about what we can do for ourselves and not do to ourselves. So, so how do we get there, though? Like, how do we... I mean, again, resources, relationship, trust, and respect. You got to understand who you're dealing with, where they are, and what they need. Again, you got people that's really suffering from mental health. That hasn't been addressed in the community. You know, what, what's the model for that? I mean, you got, I can ask questions all day long, but I don't see it. If it exists, I'm, I'm willing to see what it is so we can maybe amend it or help change it, you know, and move in the right direction. You got a lot of kids that's hopeless. Like you say, they grew up without a father or father was in prison. So they had to raise themselves. They hungry. They go to school just to eat lunch. And we got the, some, our school system, we need better, you know, equipment so they can succeed and compete against the other school, you know. It's a lot of different problems that we want to address head on, but you can't say that it's being done because as I look at the statistics, we steady failing. I mean, you, I might beat you to it. You want to talk about what Trump said, like, yo, did he lie? Hmm. Or we didn't want to hear from him. No, I, I thought about that too, and I was saying, I feel like he didn't lie, but the thing that I didn't like was, he, he's not helping, you know what I'm no, saying? But I, no, but, some, but, but, you know, I think you're absolutely right. You know, whatever 
his job description or or whatever it calls for, he probably could do a lot more for Baltimore. I don't know what all that's about in terms of him going at the Elijah Cummings because, you know, he's a chairman of the Oversight Committee. I don't know if that's something he said, well, you talk about me in Russia, I'm going to talk about you in Baltimore. I can go on and on about that. But the main important issue for me is that if there's an issue that needs to be addressed, we should have to wait for politicians to tell us, you know, we got to do it ourselves. But they are responsible for more things than they are doing. And I think they should be held accountable no matter who they are. Because we still got vacant houses, we still got rats, and most of us in the inner city have come immune to it. We normalize that, and that shouldn't be the case. Because if you tell me right now down the street there's a guy that has a band, drum set and mm-hmm. matches on, Howard yep. and North Avenue, right? Yep. I will bet you a million dollars you'll never see that in Roland Park. You'll never see that down in Federal Hill in front of the Marriott Hotel. You would never see that. It wouldn't be allowed. Why not? Why is it allowed here and not allowed there if we won Baltimore? Mm. So that's a disconnect for me. You know, so I think there's a conversation to be had about why things are happening and why it's being allowed to happen to our people. And so we fix that through, I'm, I'm asking because I don't know, we fix that through rules and legis- legislations. And well, legislation, legislation is, is, is a part, but you got to have the right, right mandates. You know, you got to have people in the office that know what they're doing and know how to get things done. And, hope, and people got hope and believe and trust and they will get those things done. People change their attitude when they know somebody care about them. You look at when Obama was president, we, we was hopeful. We mm-hmm. was hoping that someone knew what we went through was going to help change some conditions. You know, although he had to be the president for the United States, not just the black community, but we had hope that someone that come from us know what we need and know what we're going through and can, and can address some of our issues. And Baltimore, which is a smaller city, is built for a million people. We only got 600,000, but you'd be blind to tell me that you don't see two different Baltimores. Mm-hmm. So when you're in a, in a position uh, as the mayor, you can bring in relationships. You know, you can bring in resources to help these people that's in need. I mean, they do it everywhere else. I'm not saying that Baltimore is going to be the best city in the world, but it should be one of the best with, with the right resources and programs and, that we have that we can offer to these kids to give them a better future. And you telling me you're willing to stop this life that Stokey living, traveling, I mean, you know, and I mean, help Baltimore and stay here? You know, I always, I mean, I, I tell Andrea, you know, I, I don't want to use the word I'm over it, but I, I don't love it, you know. I don't, I mean... Standing around a bunch of 15, 20 year old kids in a mosh pit, screaming, yelling. I mean, I done that, you know. And I, I conquered that in a way where as though I made a guy one of the most successful artists, you know, in this, this generation. And he's doing very well for himself. I'm super proud of him. And I love him like a son. But I think I'll be doing my seed disservice if I don't bring the proper resources and help we need right now. I can always go back to music. But do I celebrate myself in LA or Atlanta, live a, a good life and watch my city die? And my city gave me everything I had. They supported me at every turn. No, that ain't the right thing to do for me. I can't do it because I wouldn't be happy. So although I could choose to leave, leave Baltimore and relocate and have a decent life, but what about the guys I grew up with? What about the kids that don't have you know, the proper resources or recreational equipment that I know I can help get them? You know, To me, that's a coward. I can't cop out on Baltimore and go live a life like, oh, it's about me because Baltimore always supported me whether it be in my individual or my official capacity, regardless of who I met after I got older, I'm talking about even as a young kid. So everything I know and learned came from Baltimore. I never was a resident of L.A. to a point where I forgot where I came from. You know, I ain't going to say I'm manufacturing, produce somewhere else. No, Baltimore gave me my identity, and I want to put myself in a position to reciprocate that same love and dedication they always gave me. I ain't going to lie, like... I I believe it, like because I have seen it. Like we see that what you're doing is a kid's dream, a mad dream. Somebody that came from nothing. Like you've been on on tours, you living a life, and the fact that you're willing to like give that up to really put back into your city, a city where it's really not a lot of hope. I'm just being real. Like I mean, everybody of, wanted like right. It kind of answered your question earlier though, when you were saying people say he's doing this. For all those things. It not mean, does. Well, I mean, you, you just said it like to walk away from a lifestyle where I know that has been able to accommodate me, you know, with wealth and success, it wouldn't make sense, right? But at some point you can't put money before your your purpose, you know what I'm saying? And my character again wouldn't allow me to do that. So I, I'm pleased with the decision I made. I, I think it's a win win situation to influence, encourage and motivate guys like you to continue to do good things for the city of Baltimore. Hopefully you don't leave and you perpetuate the same positive notion that, that myself is doing today. And hopefully guys behind you will continue to do it to a point where it's so contagious that we change our thinking. 
I, I know it can be done. I know for a fact if I can get 10 J. Hills in the room and J. Hill can get 10 more J. Hills in the room, then we have a movement. You know, it's been done before. We just got to believe in ourselves and stop being so negative and pessimistic saying what can't happen and why this, why that, you know what I'm saying? Because if you ask me, you know, we can't get, it can't get any worse, you know, from somebody saying, oh, I'm going to trust his vision, you know, because it's not a permanent situation, you know. I mean, they had who they wanted in office. They Everybody who voted for this particular person for the last 20,000 years got who they wanted because it go by who you vote for, not by who you want, you know. And I think a lot of things in Baltimore need to change. If not myself, somebody that knows the people, that's from the people or of the people who really going to have the people's best interests. So if, my question, if you don't win, right? Right. Are you willing to stay back and still help that I, person? I, I'm going I'm to stay and support. I, again, that doesn't change. The narrative doesn't change. I'm going to always support my city. I support them now. It's just that some people don't want help. You, know, you can't force your, yourself on people. Some people feel like, you know, they got to figure it out. You know, I mean, unfortunately, that's how I feel now. But over the last several years, I was able to go to City Hall and talk to Stephanie Rollins Blake about what we think we can do. You know, prior to that, um, Captain Proof, Rizana, we had meetings about what I can do to help them. So I was always a phone call away. I mean, they would call me personally, so it's not like I'm bragging, but we had a relationship that I thought was genuine and unique in itself for my background to have a man call me asking for help. I don't think a lot of people know that. I mean, and, you know. But not, that's why I'm glad we got because I don't think people know that she I mean, was that hands on in the man's office and things like well, that. Well, again, depending on who you talk, and hopefully your audience can be in the, we can impress your audience on the things I've done for the last five years. Again, you know. Prior to the riot, you know, and on the ground, you know, and to this day, me and Stephanie Brown and Blake still stay in contact with each other, you know. Um, me and Sheila Dixon are great friends, you know what I'm saying? Um, I can't say one bad word about her, you know. If she decided to run, let the people decide, you know. I think what we need now is somebody who's definitely of the people understanding what's going on and can control the narrative, you know. I, de I definitely think you other people, and being in that, I think... It comes just like the good, it comes with the bad too. I feel like um, somebody was telling me about, I didn't think about it, and we were talking about mental health, and somebody was talking about the uh, the page you do with your pops, or your pops page. Right. And you on there, and somebody was, like I said, I never even thought about it because I'm one, it, oh, I'm one of the, <laughs> all right, I'm one of, I'm one of the people, we say the people, right? And I feel like you are a part of the people, but being a part of the people is a good thing and a bad thing, man, we talking about mental health. And I feel like we're so desensitized to what actually what mental health is, and some somebody would say, if not us, right. somebody somewhere would say, you being on Instagram antagonizing this man to go through what he went through in the past to relive that is a is a who would do who, who like because y'all talk about a lot of things that that's comedy. So let me ask you a question. Oh, well, let me let you finish. So so it's just comedy. No, no, go ahead. I'll let you finish. No, I'm just saying like some person, somebody somewhere would say that that's a sense of uh, having a mental health issue. I, I mean, because it's y'all like y'all joke about a lot of things that go on, but like you said, if it's not true, I, I'm just I'm just curious how can how can somebody even compare comedy on social network to what I do in real life? Like that's that's comedy. Nine, if not ten out of ten things that he say is for laughter. It's not to you know demoralize or, or deprive him from having. His medication, that man doesn't have any mental health issues. Mm -hmm. that, that man is a comedian. He has done stand-up comedy shows. We've done comedy shows together. That's a comedian. Not saying that he's, he has and He's a, a comedian, dog. This is a comedian. Like, we've done shows together. He's done plays. This is not nobody who I found down in the Harbor and I'm picking on. This man <laughs> is almost 60 years old, a grown man. And right. He's a comedian. He just found his passion later on in life. And with my platform, I try to help him elevate that to a point where so he get more jobs and more opportunities, which he have. He has done comedy shows in certain restaurants and certain bars and things like that. He got t-shirts he sell. So for someone to say that, again, you know, we can't keep fumbling, worrying about the wrong things. Again, if what if him, me laughing on social network is causing somebody some harm or depriving somebody of their liberty, their safety, then point it out. Show me where it's written in this you can't laugh and joke. Because we need to laugh more. He have helped people get through days where though I couldn't because of his sense of humor. Now I, I don't understand. It's just, like I said, it's just Sometimes, like, I don't mean to keep comparing it to, like, Mr. Cop. It's just when I was in this position, I remember people saying that I couldn't be who I was because well, of the position. Not, that's the, that's the, that's because the, what happens is we're not just representing. You're not representing Stokey anymore. Like, you're representing Baltimore. So you're saying, you are you asking me what I do that moving forward? Or you saying... Moving forward. 
Who's I, well, I haven't done it since. Right. I mean, no, I, like I, was, I, I have to ask that question. No, one, one, reason, one, one thing I learned, right, and I, I'm going to tell you this about a job. I, I'm going to respect the office as much as I can, as best as I can, with, with authority that's vested in me. But as a person, if someone wants me to change, they shouldn't vote for me. Because I think the reason why they want me to be mad, those that vote for me, because I'm organic, I'm real, and I'm humble. I can't, I'm going to joke. I joke with them all day long. You can't expect me to walk in there and be, you know, green face, like nothing is, is wrong, but everything is politics. That, that's not going to be me. I'm going to have an open door policy. I'm going to have stakeholders come in and talk about things that's going on that's important to them as well as their community. I'm going to laugh. I'm going to joke. I'm not going to wait until I go to a comedy show to have fun, but I'm not going to be disrespectful. What you see on social network, whether it be my individual page or his page, has been laughed at at its highest level. We haven't offended no one. We haven't played with nobody disrespectful. So when you have people having those type of conversations, to me, that's like a slap in the face to those parents who lost their sons and their daughters who need to find ways to grieve. Because everybody don't want to grieve with a gun. Some people want to grieve by laughter and having fun. You know, you got people like Cleon, who's one of the best comedians in the Baltimore City, and he probably paid taxes. And he's a good person. That's what they do for a living. They are knocking people now for what they do for a living. I don't think they're knocking them. It's just I think some people look at things like, well, this person isn't trying to be our mayor, so it's okay. Because sometimes, like when you get into a position, it magnifies so, everything you're so doing. So, question: So, when you have professional athletes that run for office, right, and they are Kevin Johnson, one of the best point guards, you know, probably one of the best point guards they may have had. He was, uh, I think, he was. The mayor, I think, of Sacramento um, one time before. And uh, I don't, don't quote me on that, but I know he was a mayor. Is it say that he's not fit to be a mayor because he played basketball? No, nah, so I don't think it's that. I think as far as... I mean, that's a different like, life. That's like, for example, life. like like Donald Trump, right? And I'm not agreeing with it, but he, I think he got caught having... Um, I forgot what they call it, but like homeboy talk. He got caught saying that. And although he before, might... Before he was mayor? No, nah. before he was president. Uh, I don't know if it was before or after. Honestly, I think about when he was talking about grabbing women's coochie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. So it's like, <laughs> now I say that to say because like, even though that was like, he might talk about that behind closed doors, but the fact that it somebody heard it is like, this I is. See, the problem. I think the problem is that what we do uh, as the people, Donald Trump never said he was a politician, and my I'm an open book. You know, you can Google all the things I've been through in my life and all my experiences. You got to worry about these other people who, who haven't been as open as I am. And I'm saying to you is that Donald Trump never said he was a politician. He was a businessman who wanted to change the directive and the narrative of the country in a way he thought would be beneficial to people who voted for him. Everybody didn't vote for Donald Trump. He didn't win by a popular vote. He, vote, he won by electoral college. However, he is the president of the United States. And he never said that he was going to be a politician. He said he was going to change some things, drain the swamp. And I think, although I agree with some of his policies and procedures, People who voted for him. You gotta respect the office, even if you don't respect him. But you can't expect people to change who they are. If that's what he was doing when he got that private show. But the thing I wanna remind you of, when you have conversations with people about, the, let's talk about the good stuff. Like I want you to have conversations so you can remind. Oh, trust me, I, trust no, me. No, I'm saying, I, but because I, I don't ever want nobody defending. I said, I don't want nobody defending. But yo, it's not about defending. You know what you? I'm saying because if somebody criticizes somebody joking, it's a joke on social network. But they don't want to talk about the funeral what he paid for when they had didn't have nobody come through with the GoFundMe page. We paid for kids' funerals and stuff like that. Let's talk about things that's meaningful, that's that's going to help move the city forward. Because if you're telling me that I'm supposed to lose my sense of humor, don't be real. I didn't hit my wife. I didn't uh, hit my son or you know steal a car and and was drunk and ran into the state bill. You know, we talk about things that happened over the last ten years of my life. And not only because of a job that I'm applying for, but I've been doing my best, and I have done my best to be obedient and respectful to the laws of this country so I can be a productive father and, and, and citizen. I have been doing that. And I think, to me, that's all that matters. If they want to critique me for what I do in public, let's find out what some other people have been doing in private that y'all know nothing about. That's a major concern. And I think, I think that's one of your advantages, but for the fact that everything is out there. So, like, can nobody say anything that people don't know? They're going to find something. They're going to <laughs> and yeah, they're gonna find some things. They're gonna talk about my wallet wasn't real. I mean, they're gonna, they're gonna. I, I, again, I just, you know, I'm prepared for whatever comes with me, man. But I, I'm just, I'm just humbled to really be in a position to really motivate someone who was hopeless to do something with their life. Listen, and, again, I feel like, like I said, 
you giving the city like the guys that's out here, like like I said, the young ones, you giving us hope. What no is, matter what they say, I'm gonna just keep it on And you don't gotta tell somebody that they don't, they don't have to defend you because people wanna tell other people their experiences. And a thousand percent my experience with you has been like I've seen you work for the city. Like I, I've seen you put work and my only only thing I could even say is like you I feel like sometimes you overextend yourself, and I feel like that's a good thing. Like well, you know what I'm saying, like not really, because I mean, honestly, like you know, one thing I learned, man, you you can't you can't get your time back, you know. And I love my family, and I want to spend as much time with my sons and my daughters as I can, and my grandkids. So sometimes I do overextend myself, and I'm like, damn, you know, I could have stayed home with my son or my daughter, because you know, you can waste money, you get that back, you waste time, it's gone. Um, I, I'm just I'm in a good place in my life, man. I'm not here to like be subjective and argue with people who have opinions on what they should or because everybody is entitled to what they want. I mean, they don't, people may not never vote for me, even if I didn't have a record, if I was light-skinned with waves, they probably still wouldn't vote. Facts. I mean, stuck in, their, going, yeah, stuck no. in their ways. I just feel, I, I mean, with my team and the people who are helping me prepare for a campaign to run in a way we give the people all of our information, the vision to change Baltimore or turn it around and move the right direction, I'm okay with that. Because I know, you know, they didn't like Jesus, you know. So it's going to be people who ain't going to like me, and I'm okay with that. You know, I'm worried about supporting the people that do like me and finding ways to do my best to turn Baltimore around with the people I know. And as an organizer and someone who's been on the ground, I have found ways to do that in my individual capacity. There's no doubt in my mind with the people in my life, I can't do that in my official capacity. And I think that what I've done thus far on the ground is a hint or what I can do if I got a bigger platform, you know, because I know people that would want to help me help other people who will do it now if I ask them to, but you got to be allowed to do certain things with other people. All right, man, I appreciate it. Listen, uh, thanks again. I think it was dope. I think uh, a lot of people, like you said, my demographic, they want to learn a lot of new things about you that they didn't know. Yeah. And I wish you much success, man. Like I said, and you know you got us here to help. I, appreciate <laughs> I mean, you, you know. already know. 100%. Yeah, I, we just, we you got, already know what's we, up. We, honestly, we just got to get people out to vote. You know, we got we to get people registered and we got to give them the vote. You know, and I think let them know why they're voting and who they're voting for. It can't be a popularity contest. It got to be somebody that they vote for that they think going to change their life, you know, and help them move in the right direction. And if I look at the complexion of Baltimore and the crisis that we're in right now, I can honestly tell you that. Um, I'm doing it because I love this city and I want to make a difference. Not because I need money, not because I need a blue check on Instagram or, you know. Uh, I mean, you already got likes. that one. I don't know, <laughs> but whatever, you know, I don't need no popularity. I mean, you got the bread too, I mean, yeah. you probably don't need I just, I'm just, I'm just blessed, man, to really be in a position. And my heart in the right place, you know what I'm saying? If my actions have been showed it, hopefully throughout the next several months, I will. But I've been doing everything I can to show Baltimore that I put them first. And if the people behind me, and I, like I said, in God's seat, See it to fruition, then it is what it is. Man, best of luck, though. For real. Oh Appreciate you, Thank man. You. Appreciate Thank you me. more.